<laughs> Welcome to the Pure Glass Poetry Panels. I'm Stan Galloway, your host, and today's panel explores history in poetry. We'll be hearing from poets in the U.S. and Canada. If you're joining us live, we ask you not to use the chat function, but instead send your questions and comments through the Q&A box at our website, pureglasspoetry.wixsite.com slash mysite. We'll take a look at those toward the end of the show, but now to get us started, let's meet our first poet. Shannon McCarvey is a poet, nonfiction writer, and media producer in Austin, Texas. She holds an MLIT in creative writing from the University of Glasgow. Her work has appeared in Footnote, a literary journal of history, Points in Case, Anastomos, Temenos, Merge, an independent journal of convergent ideas, Furnace Review, and the seminal two-hour theatrical production, The Women of Ill Repute, Refute. Thank you, Shannon, for being here with us today. Thank you so much for having me. This is such a welcome respite from my day job as a TV producer. So I'm happy to be here today to talk about the oral tradition of poetry um, as it relates to uh, the use of history in poetry. So um, just a, a little backstory about myself. I, I started writing poetry at a really young age um, and like many poets that were coming up in young poets that were coming up in the 90s i don't want to date myself but um you know i became entrenched in um the spoken word movement that was happening at the time and uh specifically the slam poetry movement which i know still exists um to the day uh, to this day i'm not involved with it anymore but in the 90s, there was a certain, um, there's a really, uh, you know, just strong charismatic movement. Um, so that was where I sort of got my, um, my footing in poetry and then eventually moved on to study um, creative writing under the poet Cyrus Cassells at um, Texas State University in San Marcos. And later, uh, my postgraduate studies at the University of Glasgow in Scotland. And it was there that um, I really became interested in um, history, in poetry specifically. You know, um, in academia, as a, uh, a poet that had a spoken word background, especially a slam poetry background, um, specifically in the early aughts, uh, you know, I, I got a lot of, there was a lot of disdain within um, the communities, you know, the academic communities as related to spoken word. Um, so in my studies, uh, in my, my postgraduate studies, I really, um, you know, I, I wanted to find uh, a way to sort of marry the the page and the stage. And I mean, it was always really funny to me that there was such a disdain, you know, because the history of, of poetry is is oral, you know, and um, specifically the, the epic poem. So the epic poem uh, to me as a, uh, you know, a poet studying poetry in an academic setting, but as a poet who also had a performance background, um, you know, it really seemed like the most logical entry point to sort of marrying the two worlds and making sense of it. And also, you know, I had kind of like a chip on my shoulder. I was like, I'm gonna show you that we can, you know, it, it, it's gotta hold up on the, the page and it's gotta hold up on the stage. Like you gotta make it, <laughs> you gotta make it interesting. You know, it, it has to be read aloud. Um, so, uh, that was really where, uh, you know, I, I started diving into history, um, as a convention in, in poetry and, um, because as, as many of you may or, or may not know, you know, the, the epic poem is, you know, rooted in, uh, you know, obviously it's, it's textless. So you, you know, it's, it's told aloud, it's a, sort of the theater of storytelling, but it also deals with, um, you know, uh, 
stories of cultural and, and national importance, you know, um, themes of, you know, heroic themes, the hero's journey. So um, when I was in, in, you know, studying postgraduate poetry, I, um, my entry point to that was uh, sort of John Brown's body. Um, because whereas I wasn't, uh, John Brown's body is a, is a poem by Stephen Vincent Binet. It was, uh, won the Pulitzer Prize for poetry in 1928, um, just as an aside. But uh, so whereas I wasn't really interested in, uh, you know, the heroes in the classical sense, I was really interested in how Binet took a, a somewhat recent American, you know, figure, the abolitionist John Brown, and turned him into this, you know, uh, hero through the convention of the epic. Um, so mind you, I'm in Scotland at the time and learning about the culture, writing constantly, immersed in, um, you know, Scottish culture and storytelling, which is rich in and of itself. And I come across the story about, uh, uh, well, it's called the anatomy murders. And uh, it's, it's probably one of Scotland's most famous uh, serial killer cases, the first one, I think. Uh, and it deals with the, the murderers, William Burke and William Hare. But in my research of that, I found uh, a really compelling account of one of their victims, a woman named uh, Mary Patterson. And uh, she, it, there was like this, super detailed 12 like the account of the last 12 hours of her life and i thought wow what an interesting concept to turn a victim you know of this murder you know into this like epic hero right and then i was like well this is there's there's a lot of things going on here um because you know Hare and burke were, were killing people in edinburgh in the 19th century um, and selling their bodies to um, Surgeon's Hall, you know, for for medical science. So, uh, you know, and because there were really strict rules at the time for, you know, what you, you know, what type of bodies you could dissect and like how you could get them. So like grave robbing and body snatching was a thing. So that's another element that's like really interesting to the story. Um, but yeah, so you have this like, uh, you know, these people who are, who are preying upon, you know, the citizens of Edinburgh, you have this victim. And then, uh, you know, uh, you have the fact that they're both sort of inextricably like linked to each other because Burke goes on to get, you know, he's hung and he uh, and his body is sold <laughs> to, you know, dissection, you know, to the to surgeon's hall. And um so it, it's just this really interesting, uh, you know, play between like Burke and Mary Patterson. So I wrote um, these these two poems. Uh, I call them twin poems, and um, you know they they can stand on their their own, but um, they are they are linked. They they belong together. And one is about Mary Patterson, and one is about William Burke, and um, and you'll find there's a lot of, uh, I wouldn't say that they're epics because they're not, but um, they're definitely in, inspired by um, epics and um, deal with the history of these two people. So that said, uh, I'm going to share my screen and I hope this works. <laughs> so, uh, and first you'll see, let's see. First, you'll see a, uh, let's see, are we there? Okay, great. So let me see. I'm going to pin this presentation so that I see it myself. So first, you'll see uh, two lithographs, I guess, of uh, one of Mary Patterson on um, the left and uh, William Burke on the right. It says down here, murderer. <laughs> so, uh, and then, uh, so now I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and get into my first poem, Mary Patterson, 1828. And 
please forgive the, the crude nature of, of sharing PDFs, but uh, I'll read this. So Mary Patterson, 1828. When it was certain her lungs were empty and the veins and her wrist were nothing more than stagnant canals, he folded her naked body like linen into a tea chest and dragged it through the streets of Edinburgh to the gates of Surgeon's Hall. It was there at the sight of her perfect flesh, Grecian and round, still warm and aching with life, a doctor offered eight pounds to buy her, nearly triple what other men might pay to bed her, perhaps even himself, whose postmortem infatuation with Mary splayed the young girl on the table uncut for two days while students, some who may, know, who may have known her in shared ways, captured with pen and paint what nature would soon destroy. No doubt in his private moments, the doctor ran his fingers along the length of her inner thigh, anatomizing without a single incision, while the cellular walls of her insides crumbled like Jericho. And maybe then she was Rahab, saved not by God, but by the Holy Spirit, preserved in whiskey for three months, a specimen, odd taxidermy, lamb to enlightenment, the lion of the new age. So that first one, um, you know, Mary was a reputed sex worker. I, that's not substantiated, but, um, but, uh, and it was rumored that there were some postmortem relationships with her at Surgeon's Hall. So that was a reference to that. The next poem is um, William Burke, 1829, and it's um, a lot more graphic. <laughs> Uh, eight months after he stripped her naked and stopped her breath with a pillow, Burke hung like a bloated bass before 25,000 hungry voyeurs. When the hangman plucked him from the line, it was said the crowds ravaged his body, dug into his flesh with fingernails. Some took knives to shave the tissue from tendon, while others ripped souvenirs from his jacket until only exposed muscle and shredded textile remained. Burke's carcass went to public dissection in an elaborate dance of scalpel and skin. What curiosities for all to behold, the doctors trawl the purple organs from the bowl of his torso and fillet the meat from the bone. It was rumored the surgeons removed Burke's skeleton as a fisherman might debone the day's catch in one connective piece. His leftovers were tossed to the students, his human leather cut and cured, tanned and stretched into binding, a pocketbook in place of a tombstone, an epitaph in dull metallic script stamped to the, to the scales of the cover, a bleak moment in time, Burke's skin pocketbook executed 28 January, 1829. So I'll stop sharing there. But um, that actually, that pocketbook, just a fun fact, um, if you're ever in Edinburgh, is on display at the uh, National Museum. And it's actually a pocketbook bound in William Burke's skin, um, which is disgusting and also very interesting. <laughs> uh, but that was, you know, these crimes, the anatomy murders, and there's been movies about this, you know, Robert Louis Stevenson wrote about the body snatchers of Edinburgh. Um, you know, these, uh, this was the crime of the century in 19th century Edinburgh. And there were, I, I really encourage you to read about it. It's, it's quite interesting, especially if you're into true crime and into history. <laughs> it's really gross, really interesting, and also very complicated. I mean, these people were so poor and, you know, they, they were Irish immigrants, uh, you know, victims of circumstance. I'm not, you know, excusing the murder of anyone, but, um, you know, they, they needed money and this guy was uh, an opportunist. Um, and they preyed upon the weak and vulnerable of the city. So, um, yeah, uh, that's all. Those are those are the poems that I'm, sh I'm sharing today. Um, and, and, and that's about it uh, as related to the topic of this discussion. Forgive me if it was rambling. <laughs>
no, I think that uh, no one turned away saying this is boring. Uh, <laughs> because it, not only in the poetry, but but in your contextualization of the poems, uh, you you grab something, and there is something about history uh, that we find fascinating, and uh, that's that's part of the impetus uh, behind forming this panel for today, is to look at what is it from our past that catches our attention. Whether we you know learn from it or not, uh, we still invest our time in learning about it. And so uh, with that, we'll go ahead and transition uh, to our next poet. Jeanette Lines is the author of seven books of poetry and two novels. Her third novel is forthcoming next year. She holds an MFA in writing from the University of Southern Maine Stone Coast program and directs the MFA in writing at the University of Saskatchewan, Canada. We're happy to have you here, Jeanette. Hi, thank you so much. And I uh, want to uh, say hi to all the students. It's really great to see that you're here. And uh, thank you so much to Professor Galloway uh, for inviting me. And uh, it's wonderful to be on this panel with um, Shannon and Dan as well. And um, yeah. Um, and, um, I, uh, I use history a lot um, in my in my poetry. Um, I it helps me jump starts a conversation. I guess that's one way to think about it. It's kind of a muse, uh, a muse um, source of inspiration. Um, as as you know, Shannon's presentation uh, revealed. I mean, my gosh, there is just treasure troves of of material to to draw on. Um, and uh, interesting little segue is that Shannon's, um, uh, you know, exploring the sort of idea of um, spectacle, right? Spectacle, and my my spectacle is kind of <laughs> different, but it's a little bit of a, a segue. So um, I, I do love nonfiction. I love biography. I, I love collections of letters. I love researching. I'm trained as an academic, and I'm you know I'm kind of a, a, a super nerd. Uh, so uh, it all kind of works. Um, I'm going to talk specifically about uh, some of the challenges that I have faced um, working with um, historical material, um, craft challenges, a certain amount of ethical questions, I guess, and, and challenges. Um, I'll, I'll focus on two very different collections of poetry. Um, could it be more different, probably, day and night? Um, this one, if you can see it, uh, it's called Archive of the Undressed. It was published in 2013, and as the title kind of suggests, it's um, it's uh, it's uh, about um, pinup girls and old Playboy magazines. <laughs> More on that in a minute. Um, the other uh, book I'll I'll speak about is uh, called um, Bedlam Cowslip: The John Clare Poems. Uh, that came out uh, a couple of years ago, and uh, John Clare was um, an English poet, uh, a nature poet, who lived from uh, 1793 to 1864. So yeah, like. 1960s Playboy magazines and um, <laughs> an English nature poet from the 19th century. So very, very, very different. Um, but uh, each each presented its own um, kind of interesting craft challenges, and you'll hear a couple of those poems as well. Um, so um, the, I guess uh, the onto the craft challenges. I mean, on, on some very basic level, when I work with historical material. I sometimes feel a little bit of a sense of mm, kind of maybe kind of guilt or something like you know. I, I sometimes I think, well, what what am I doing? Am I just am I just stealing? <laughs> like am I, you know, am I I kind of am I kind of ripping off this material for my own ends and my own purposes? Am I appropriating? Um, what what is my relationship uh, to this material? Um, so those are sort of ethical kinds of things that. Um, um, nag at me when I'm working on these projects. Um, I, I don't um, per, um, at all claim to have any of these questions or challenges or problems sorted or or, or solved, but um, it's good to ask the, the questions. Um, you know, and am I just lifting something to, you know, for my own um, my own artistic um, projects. Um, so a main craft challenge I find working with um, historical material, and it'll be interesting to hear from my colleagues, um, is like 
how to turn, for lack of a better way to say it, how to turn information into poetry. How to, how to turn information into, like, you know, give, get, how to give it musicality, how to make it be poetry, how to breathe a spark of poetic life into, um, you know, dates and information, some of which is lots of it, like, incredibly fascinating, but, but some of it is just basic dry, you know, nuts and bolts information. So how to make that transition, how to spark it with life, how to generate energy, how to, I guess, as, as Ezra Pound would have said, make it new. Otherwise, I'm just, I'm just making a watered down version of something that already exists. So uh, sometimes it can be, it can be challenging. Um, uh, I've tried a few um, approaches. Um, uh, well, with the Playboy poems, um, I think there's a lot of irony in play. Um, you know, uh, I, I tend to write humor. I like to write humor right? um, if it happens. Uh, it's hard to force it, but um, I enjoyed the kind of iron, ironic relationship I had with some of the um, the old Playboy pinups. I'm interested in celebrity, but I'm also interested in, in that book. I was interested in aftermath. Like, what? Who were these women? What What happened to them? Did they have happy lives? Did they go back into the kitchen and just become, you know, nice American housewives? Or what did they do? What did they? I'm really interested in in that in that aftermath, what do you do after you've been um, um, centerfold for Hugh Hefner, right? Like, where do you go after that kind of? Um, so there's a lot of sort of play and irony in, in that collection. Um, I worked with um, some uh, creating anachronisms, deliberate anachronisms, like clashing together different time periods. Um, so that was with the, the Playboy poems. With the John Clare poems, it was more like uh, that I worked on that book for about eight years, and I kind of thought, why am I doing this? Because how, who am I to try to what get inside the head of um, a, a man who lived in England in the early 19th century? Is that even you know what common ground really is there? And other than um, John Clare was rural, he was very impoverished. Um, I'm a rural person um, from a kind of hard scrabble, you know, kind of world that was changing in terms of agriculture. John Clare lived during the um, land enclosures in England and that, that this distressed him uh, enormously. Um, and, um, you know, we, we didn't really have that, but certainly the rise of corporate agribusiness um, impacted small farm, those trying to make their living on the land. So I, I tried to find a way in and the, the, the Clare poems are more, I think, experiments with um, with voice, I, I suppose. Um, John Clare spent the last 20 years of his life um, in a, quote, lunatic asylum. Uh, there are great stories about it. He ran away, he escaped. Uh, he, um, the rock star poet at the time is Lord Byron, so it, apparently Clare decided that, he, he told everyone in the asylum that he was, he was Byron, <laughs> or he thought he was Shakespeare. He would have kind of delusional um, episodes. So it's quite a, and there's now a mythology around all this. It was a great story among other things. So he was, um, he was pretty fa uh, fascinating. But you know, they say that writing is, um, the project of writing is one of empathy. You know, like, what is it like to be somebody else? It, like, I love writing, it gets me out of my own head. What is it, uh, try to imagine what it's like to be um, another person, even someone very, very different from you. So that was um, that was fun. So those were those were some of the the challenges to try to make that leap. Like the Claire project's almost a little bit like speculative fiction. You know, I really I'm, I'm never going to be able to be in that space. So um, the imagination has to do a lot of heavy lifting. But so did the the research source material. And um, Jonathan Bate, he's an English scholar. Jonathan Bate's magnificent biography of John Clare was a um, major, major um, source. But there are many other uh, wonderful works of scholarship on Clare. Um, he kind of fell into uh, obscurity during his lifetime, but then there's been a, a real resurgence of him in the last maybe 30 years. And he's sort of considered now in a way uh, England's Robbie Burns, you know, or he would be called maybe now an eco-poet, you know. Um, so that's just a little bit of, of context. Um, and now just, um, they're pretty short poems. Um, 
a poem from um, Archive of the Andress, the Playboy poems. And this this kind of was a crassus, you know, I would sit and look <laughs> at Playboy, right? I read it for the articles. <laughs> I would sit and look at these pictures um, and, and, and uh, all the ads are fascinating. Um, it, the aesthetic of it was, was just really, really, um, you know, kept kind of drew me in. You have to stay really obsessed with this material because you might be working on these books for, I don't know what, what Shannon and Dan, Dan would say, but uh, four, five, six, seven, eight years. So you, you really, there's something has to be there that is pulling at you. Um, so this poem, um, Yvette Vickers was a pinup girl. She did hair shampoo ads uh, way back when. Uh, this is uh, a rose for Yvette Vickers, 1928 to 2010 or 2011. She had a suitcase, terrific tresses, the white rain girl. White rain, guaranteed not to dull or dry your hair. Compact as a firecracker on Independence Day. Star material, Honey Parker in Attack of the 50-Foot Woman, cast by Cagney in Shortcut to Hell. Then Hefner as Miss July, 1959. Being stalked made her screams in Attack of the Giant Leeches highly authentic. She grew gothic, monstrous, chaste, withdrew behind locked gates. Benedict Canyon was not home, was home. That was the worst of it. Her fan mail cobwebbed, crammed in the box, said her neighbor who scaled the wall at last. Hello, hello, found Miss July. Reporters went crazy for the word mummified, dead possibly a year. Swallows swooped through roof rents in her dilapidated mansion. White rain, playmate with no one to play with. Recluse, mummy, victim of giant leeches, Miss July. So that was me trying to write a, a gothic poem, I guess. Um, and I, I'm kind of riffing off of um, um, William Faulkner's, maybe some of the students have studied the story, um, William Faulkner's uh, uh, incredible story, A Rose for Emily. Uh, it's not the same, but <laughs> the person, the person dead, end up dead was, was different. But um, it, it was kind of fun to, to try to see this through a gothic lens. It's really a freaky story. Uh, this poor woman had been discovered so long after her death. Like what loneliness, you know? The more I read about the um, the lives of these women, a lot of them did not end well. <laughs> they, they were in plane crashes and oh, terrible things. I don't know what, what, I mean, not all of them obviously, but um, Dorothy Stratton was murdered. She was a Canadian playmate from Vancouver, Canada. So um, yeah, the aftermath of celebrity. Um, that I feel like that, and you know, honestly, that is um, not. Uh, I'm not happy with how I absorbed the material in, in that. I think that was um, one of the more le one of the least successful poems. If, if for fiction writer, I'd say it's an, it's an information dump. <laughs> you know, it, it seemed like a list poem that just had a lot of information. But um, that's one um, example. Um, this one's quite different uh, from Archive of the Undress. This is uh, just playing with anachronism and. Um, it doesn't get any set up really at all. Um, this is called um, Emily Dickinson Reads Playboy. Saturday night in Amherst, wild night, wild night. Crazed flies strike the lantern. My fingers buzz, shadow the wall, pale, tiny pipes. I crack the centerfold. Dare to wonder if dear Mr. Higginson is viewing the same picture. My digits tickle the computer keys, press send. Soon, oh soon, dear Mr. Higginson shall plump my heart's deep moss. Soon I'll haul the pizza in a basket I ordered up by rope. In through my window, double cheese, wild pie, wild pie. I'll eat it all myself. A hunger untitled, bundled, and slant. My top four buttons out of 78 unhooked. A scathing expanse of collarbone. So that's Emily Dickinson reads Playboy. And I really hope, I mean, I <laughs> I adore Emily Dickinson. I, I just, I didn't know if this is a terrible thing to, to write or not. But it was really um, fun. And it's not a like, profound uh, messaging happening really other than I suppose it was it was fun to play with notions of like privacy and seclusion like you hear so much about Emily Dickinson you know up in her room bundling her little beautiful little poems and 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 on the you know on the one hand and this sort of 
kind of titillation of doing something transgressive. It was just, it was just a lark. It was just uh, for fun. And, and and now for something completely different, <laughs> switch to switch your minds to early nineteenth century uh, England, and um, you know, poor struggling nature poet uh, John Clare, um, just just such a great lover of 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 the land, um, and. Um, uh, there's just two poems. They're they're both uh, pretty short as well. Uh, there's a Scotland connection too with um, Shannon because um, I was. Uh, if you ever get to go to um, um, if you want to go in a writing workshop, go to Hawthornden Castle in Scotland, and you you're in this castle writing for a month. And unfortunately, I had a writer's block, and I was really really frustrated. This is a terrible time to have a writer's block. And so I, they have a lovely library there. So I wandered over there, and sometimes your your writing material will find you. So don't don't give up because it's this weird cosmic thing. I just my mother had just passed away. I just sat there at my desk. I was like, I came all the way to Scotland, and I can't write. This sucks. <laughs> so I went to the library and uh, just pulled Jonathan Bates. Oh, I've, I've never heard of this poet, John Clare. I just I crawled in bed and devoured Jonathan Bates. Magnificent biography, and I got hooked on, on John Clare. Um, so I did work, as I said, from letters, biographies, um, scholarly articles. Um, I went to a John Clare conference um, in England in 2014, and there were painters there, and poets, and scholars. It's just, just wonderful. Um, another challenge, though, with the Clare um, project was language. Do I write poems that sound like 1820? They can't really, it's going to be really stilted, right? So I pretty quickly it would have been fun to try but i pretty quickly dispense with that with that but there's some just incredible the the words the language and to me it was exotic because it was different right like um a clock a clay is a, a lady a ladybug um um, John Barleycorn is, 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 is ale, it's beer. He would always say, I've had too much John Barleycorn. It's he's had too much ale. Uh, don't frit the birds, don't scare the birds. Many, many, many other examples. So that was just a joy and to just immerse in that whole linguistic vernacular. This is, you know, this is sort of rural people's talking, right? So that was super fun. Um, but a lot of the material came from uh, biographical sources, not not just Jonathan Bates' biography, but um, other other. I read and read. You know, you have to read a lot when you write, as as you guys all know. Um, so Claire um, was a little bit disappointed that his uh, poetry career didn't take off. Um, Eighteen eighteen, I think his first book came out, um, and he was um, kind of. Everybody's obsessed with Byron, but, but Claire had really wanted to meet John Keats and, and never managed to do that. So I thought, well, how would I write a poem about something that didn't happen? That's kind of an odd premise. But um, anyway, gave it a, as they say in England, I gave it a go. And um, this poem's called Another Brush with Keats. Still no Keats, though close, his doctor. The doctor of Keats plans to study my head. To have the same medic, though not the same ailment, is something. The first time I did not meet Keats, he scribbled an address, not mine, on one of my letters. To Keats, it was simply scrap paper. To have the same publisher as Keats is something. The second time I did not meet Keats, he was dying, though sent his opinion of my poems. It should not take 20 lines to describe the grass in so many words. The dying, I reckon, do not have that kind of time. The grass, I suppose, must be grass and be quick about it. Because Keats was dying, I wished him well at the wishing well near Sorty Well. Had he not been dying, I might have written, quizzing him on the nesting habits of his nightingale, and must everything be so Grecian? And to me, it matters, the weave and on of grass. It matters. So that poem is, um, you know, it's kind of a monologue kind of poem, and it's it's about a kind of fight of between different aesthetics and poetics, poetics and types of poetry. You know, the kind of neoclassical on the one side, and really getting into nature and you know being granular around your local square of earth on on the other side. Uh, so that was. Um, that was a, a fun one to to do, even though it started out in an odd. Well, how, why would you write about something that did did not happen? But uh, people's relationship with celebrity, I'm, I'm really interested in that. 
um, as well. And so just one more um, quick one. Um, I didn't know this. You learn so much when you, when you research on these projects. One of the best-selling books of all time, I mean, of course, the Bible, but um, uh, a book about fishing. <laughs> Who knew? Uh, the Complete Angler by Isaac Walton. And uh, it was one of John Clare's favorite books. And um, so this is just to finish up with this quick one, because I've probably gone um, a little bit over time. I, I timed it, and it wasn't, but now I think it is. Um, so, um, as I mentioned, Claire was very very poor, impoverished. She had been hoping to make money from poetry, like, ha ha, right? Making money from poetry. Um, and uh, he, um, this is sort of the lore about Claire, but he, he never seemed to have enough paper to write on. And uh, they say he wrote his poems on the brim of his hat and things. Again, it's a good story, right? But um, the way life goes, you know, um, towards the end of his life, apparently the largest paper mill in all of England opened in this town. Uh, you know, that's kind of how life goes sometimes, right? So this is just a little bit of a, a fun one. Alone with Walton's The Complete Angler. Paper! But now, too trouble tethered to scribble one stanza. Waited for a southern wind, just as Walton advised. Still nothing. The angle wrong. Words are trout in nighttime, deep pooled, hearing yet biting not. The finest canker flies, stone flies, or more flies fail to lure them to the surface. Trout seek lusty lives far from my perusing pencil, and I, an honest poet, incomplete, swarmed by silent blue. I do not ask so very much, only to send forth a rallying cry. A fish, a fish, a poem, a poem. So that was um, Alone with Walton's A Complete angler and um that's um yeah that those are those are some of the, the challenges and the joys that i that i had and um i, I look forward to uh, questions and conversation and uh thank you very much for listening thank you jeanette uh, again fascinating material uh that you've uh, brought us into and remind us that uh it, it isn't just one thing uh, it isn't you know one one moment of history that we spend our lives on, but but many moments that connect in various ways, and and these two books as you've uh, shown to us as a kind of uh, uh, you know the swing of the pendulum, you know as to, you know how far out it might go uh, in your work and how each of us might apply that to our own work. Let's go now to our uh, third poet for the day. Dan Veach is the founding editor of Atlanta Review and a prize-winning poet and translator of Chinese, Arabic, Spanish, and Anglo-Saxon. His poetry books include Elephant Water and Lunchboxes. His latest translation is Beowulf and Beyond, classic Anglo-Saxon poems, stories, sayings, spells, and riddles. We're so happy you could join us today. Thanks, Dan. Um, and I'm happy I got to read to many of the students there at Bridgewater uh, when I visited. And a special thanks to Sam, who is my guide during this experience. Um, poetry and history. Um, I actually had a personal brush with uh, some serious history. Uh, I was a leader of the movement against the Vietnam War when I was in college in the 60s. Um, then later, when I was editor of Atlanta Review, an international poetry journal, I was very frustrated that I couldn't do more to oppose the American invasion of Iraq. Um, at that point, uh, an Iraqi poet that I had published uh, emailed me and told me that he had uh, some friends collecting poetry in Baghdad. Would I like to see the manuscript? <laughs> there was probably nothing in the world I would more have liked to see at that point. Uh, the result was uh, Flowers of Flame, um, The Unheard Voices of Iraq, which was the first book to publish Iraqi poets themselves, not American poets writing about the war, but actual Iraqis, uh, Sunni, Shias, and Kurds, men and women. Um, as you might guess, it's very difficult to write about the destruction of your own country. Uh, as one Iraqi poet put it, 
How can you extract poems and shrapnel from your chest at the very same time? One way was to personify the war, uh, to talk about it as if it were a person. Uh, a friend of mine, Dunya McHale, an Iraqi poet, uh, her book was called The War Works Hard, asking us to sympathize with the, uh, the war for change. Uh, this poem um, by Abdul Razak al-Rubai is entitled, <clears throat> Tomorrow the War Will Have a Picnic. And uh, poets in the old days were considered prophets, and um, Abdul certainly was a prophet because he wrote this poem on the eve of the shock and bomb, uh, shock and awe bombing of Baghdad. Tomorrow the war will have a picnic. Store water, bread, and air, because the war goes hungry now and then. And if our tender bodies aren't enough to satisfy it, our childish pranks, our innocence, our dreams, it will be compelled to eat the buildings, bodies sleeping in graves, books, streets, and biscuits. It will be forced to eat unshakable mountains, statues, and stones, anything to feed its body of smoke, bullets, and shrapnel. Tomorrow, the war will have a picnic. Abandoned delicacy, laughter, dancing, childhood, women, beds, cups of tea and milk, classroom desks, and what's left of dreams splintered in corners. No more chocolate, no more kissing in public. Things like these are not good for the health of the war, which is having a picnic tomorrow. Another way of um, dealing with this really impossible uh, thing to write about is to use metaphors um, and sometimes bitterly ironic ones comparing the ugliest things to the most beautiful things. Uh, a Vietnamese um, refugee um, wrote the next poem which won Atlanta Review's International Poetry Competition. This is the Atlanta Review Poetry Journal. This poem is called Flower Bomb by Vuong Quoc Vu. My brother, come home from war, sits now for hours in the garden. I see now, he says, everything as flowers, the tendency of all things to bloom, even the way the body bleeds, the fire from guns, the sun unfurling after the longest night. Everything blooms. Brother, he said, I saw so many dead. I realized the body is, after all, above all, a fragile, flowery thing. Despite the marble column of its spine, the great architecture of how it stands, the arches and taut ropes of muscle, it is easily torn apart, gunned through, drowned, plowed under, how it withers with time and hunger. When I saw the dead, I didn't look at faces and never, never into the eyes. I avoided all implications of a soul, a name. I looked at hands, those miracles of sinew and vein and imagine them to be leaves. I have seen severed hands, as if they'd fallen from a tree, hands crushed and burned crisp. I have seen wounds on them, like purple trillium, forced through the skin. I have seen blood that spilled and splattered like asters, the plum colors of viscera. Brother, I have come home from hell. How now shall I tell the story of man? The wars, wars, wars until the end of time. How now shall I tell? My mind already a shattering leg of glass, my heart bullet hole. To write in blood or in red rose petals?
but are actually personally involved in history, especially if it's painful history. Our first instinct in writing about it probably is to, to hit the reader over the head as hard as possible. I suffer, now it's your turn. Not surprisingly, this approach is seldom well received. Sometimes it takes many years for an experience to mature and find an adequate expression. My own experience as a 60s radical and then my feelings about the Trump years suddenly coalesced when I learned about the demise of a little poetry journal with a very suggestive name. This poem is uh, from Lunchboxes, my latest collection. And the poem is called Surprised. <clears throat> Just got the news today. Surprised by joy is now defunct. Surveying the current scene, one can't be too surprised at this. Little poetry magazines are daily being born and dying. But was this a natural death? Two possibilities come to mind. Is Joy so universal now that no one is surprised to see her? Seems improbable somehow. More likely our current triumvirate, Donald, Ryan, Mitch McConnell, has outlawed her altogether. Poor Joy. I knew her in my youth, back in the 60s. She liked to hang out with peace and love. A fairy floating thing, she seemed to have no needs beyond a bunch of flowers and perhaps a string of beads. Like many another refugee, like polar bears and coral reefs, she suffered when the climate changed. The flower children overthrown by big oil and money men, by former Christians making friends with hatred, war, and greed. Poor Joy. I've been surprised how much I miss her quiet voice, her gentle grace. Now anger begets anger, hatred, hate, and the lambs of God are being led into the slaughter. Will we ever see her lovely face again? Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Uh, I'm reminded, uh, just as I was when Jeanette was speaking, that uh, that history is everything that occurred from the moment we're now speaking, uh, whether that is you know yesterday or whether it is 200 years ago, uh, and we've we've looked at that uh, you know, history as it happens moment uh, in your uh, the work that you shared from the Iraqi poet uh, to uh, poems of our childhood uh, and then you know again going back you know, into the 19th century with both uh, Shannon and Jeanette. Uh, I want to remind uh, those who are going to send in questions uh, that this is the time to do that. Uh, but I wonder if uh, between uh, the panelists, we might explore just a little bit more uh, how you get into something that isn't yours in history. Um, I, I think that Dan's poems have that very personal element in them, the way that he um, expressed particularly the, the final poem uh, about Surprise by Joy. But everything has an element that is outside us as well. And I wonder how we, we take that personal and impersonal and, and merge them in a poem, if that might be a starting point for us while our questions come in. Well, if you don't mind me piping up, I uh, one thing that I was struck, I was taking little notes as Jeanette and Dan were speaking, but Something that really struck me was the act of writing as an empathetic exercise, you know, because you're right, we, you know, you, you face a lot of 
challenges when you're writing about history? You know, Jeanette said, you know, do we try to dig into like, I mean, in my case, like 19th century Scottish vernacular. I mean, I tried. I don't recommend it. <laughs> it was really hard. And it came out sounding stilted and, and you know, weird. But you have to sort of experiment with that. Um, and it's all part of that exercise of getting into, you know, the skin and bones of these people that you're reading about, that you're researching. And I think that not only from a human experience, it's important to do that because we all need empathy, especially in this day and age. But as a writer, it's very important because, you know, uh, we face that writer heavy challenge all the time, you know, and uh, you want to invite the reader along with you. You don't want to beat the reader over the head with somebody else's false experience or whatever, you know. So I think that empathy was the big takeaway for me. Um, and especially like when when. Jeanette was reading. I love your your first poem, uh, even though you sort of characterize it as a as a list. Uh, there is a place for that, and um, and you know, from a from a feminist perspective, I mean, that is just something that really appeals to me. And yeah, like, what happens to these people? You know, who are they? And I ask that to myself a lot. You know. Um, and when you said, you know, in my head, I was sort of answering your rhetorical question when you were like, what happens to these women, you know, after they become pinups? And I was like, well, they disappear. <laughs> they go back to their lives and, you know, uh, die mummies in abandoned houses, apparently. But I'm joking. I'm not trying to make light of it. But, you know, they, they go back to obscurity and their lives turn into whatever lives turn into you know and and i think that simply asking that question and exploring that is so important to um you know this quest this thirst that we have for understanding the human experience for understanding other people and telling their stories um you know through the uh, but also through the lens of our own experience uh and i just think that's so beautiful and so important especially for marginalized communities women people of color I, that's just incredibly an incredibly important exercise and i can't uh encourage writers to do that enough um so yeah that's uh that's what i wanted to say uh and 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 likewise to uh, to dan i mean I've never been in a war, you know, I don't know what it is to have, you know, uh, you know, what was it that you said? It was so beautiful. It was like, how can you, you know, pull Extract. poetry from, yeah, from your, chest. from your chest. Yes. Such a powerful statement to make because it's like, I'm just trying to survive here, man. You know, like I'm just trying to live, exist, survive, you know? Um, so I think that, considering these you know situations that we couldn't ever you know most people couldn't ever imagine being in and exploring them intimately is just such a beautiful exercise and um and i think history just to land the plane bring it back <laughs> i think history gives us that experience you know and and, and allows us this limitless uh you know sort of treasure trove of 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 opportunity sorry you know but it's you there's just so much material and for the nerds among us i hear you jeanette um you know it's so much fun because you just you just dig in and immerse yourself in in all of these things um so i and i love applying that to to poetry so um that's all i gotta say <laughs> Yeah, I can uh, weigh in a little bit. I really want to say I loved your both of your presentations, and yeah, uh, Dan, I'm so glad you spoke about metaphor because for for poets, that's the that's the heartland, you know. That's 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 the toolbox, and um, talk about making something new, right? That that you know, this is this, and as humans, we have the imaginative imaginative agency to actually make that fuse that those things together and and it can just kind of a mind-bending
kind of a thing. Um, uh, well, because the, the two books I spoke about were so different, um, the, the, the play by one, um, I'm, I'm, okay, my most, you know, often I felt very self indulgent because I, you know, I, I, I listened to a lot of music from the, the period from the from 60s, an incredible era for music. Um, so that, and, and I love popular culture, so that was a little bit of a voyeuristic, uh, kind of guilty pleasure kind of thing for me. But the Claire book was, uh, uh, the stakes were higher. Uh, it was a way more challenging. I, I didn't, I wasn't alive then, I didn't live then. Um, and it was sort of, um, forces it forces you to think if you're working with material that's way outside of your, you know, regular realm of your, your life, it, it forces you to think about what is it that, can what commonality do we have as humans I guess no matter what time period we live in and what what gender we are what you know whatever um, there, there sure there must be things that still like so when when Claire was put in the asylum for 20 years he didn't want to go at all and he, he was apparently horrendously homesick and missed his wife and family and um, I thought I, I thought I, I, I think I can kind of a man that must have been like for him it was like being in prison you know and i think they let him sort of walk around the grounds and things and but um and he did run away that one time someone actually made a little film about him he walked home like 50 miles or something it's kind of a fame and you know his worn out shoes um so certain feelings seem to be you, you can sort of try to time travel yourself in there and see what would that feel like and and that's um it's like fiction writing too when you it's like world building i guess in a way if you were writing um uh, writing this in in fiction and i can i can ask um a question and like maybe for i guess maybe it'd be for either of you but maybe it's for dan so when you have such a personal um a personal stake in material um that is incredibly compelling you know to 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 create but it, it must be really difficult as well, is it? Or like, how did you um, make that negotiation? Or like, I would just sometimes sit there and, you know, weep, I guess, or like, did, I don't know if that's not a very articulate question, but. <laughs> well, no, it is. I mean, and in fact, um, I didn't write about it for 50 years because uh, it, it just felt lousy to, to revisit those oh. things. And there's a whole school of poetry that says you should be as raw as possible and you should, you know, rip open your chest and expose it to the world. Um, that's not my school. Um, and I, you know, when you listen to something like Beethoven, that triumphant music is a triumph over some real difficulties, some real, you know, personal problems and tragedies. Uh, but at that point, he had triumphed over it and you get to triumph along with it. So, you know, um, and in this case, what finally opened that for me was, I was had to subscribe to Duotrope and they tell you what little magazines have gone defunct in the meeting in the last month and there's always a bunch of them. Uh, and it was just that odd little thing. Oh no, surprised by joy is no longer. And it's like, well, big surprise, you know, there's no joy anymore. Um, so it was just that little thing that gave me an opening into it. I mean, you have to find a slant. There's the, the saying, tell it slant, but it's hard to find that slant. And it, most of the time, you know, it just opens up accidentally for you. You can't force yourself on it. Yeah, that's an, that's an excellent response. Uh, you, there are the poems that visit us, you know, like dreams or like phantoms. Um, and, and then there are the poems that we set out to write and we discover along the way the poem that we should have started writing uh, when we started. And so, you know, I don't ever take away from the intentionality of writing a poem. Uh, it may not be the poem you end up with and often isn't, uh, but it might lead you there. Uh, just as as experiences do the same thing, some some this window that opens up 
uh, mm. says, here's an angle. This is an angle that we can we can get to the heart of this issue without spilling the blood that I'm so careful to keep in place. <laughs> it's like Jeanette's uh, question, how do you make a poem out of information? And information is spread out like a galaxy, all these little shining stars, like, oh, that's interesting, oh, that's interesting. And I think the first step maybe is just to have effective contrast. I mean, the Playboy Centerfold who dies is a mummy alone and abandoned. I mean, you did that as a poet. You said, oh, that's the most powerful contrast. I'm going to, you know, give it, you know, first, first place here. Um, and then hopefully, I mean, at some point that, that whole galaxy, you know, or that whole spread of stars collapses down into a coherent galaxy and you begin to feel empathy. I mean, you, the human feeling for this comes out and you begin to, to feel like you know this person in some way and can speak for them in some way. Yeah, uh, that's, that's, I think, exactly right. Let's go over to Brittany and see what kind of questions have come in for us. Okay, I've got um, a couple. So the first question is open to all three panelists, um, and they would like to know if you guys have any advice for delving into topics of whether they're politically charged or social justice topics in a sensitive way. That sounds like dance arena. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, one one way is to be honest to your own experience. And if you really are honest to your own experience, you won't be doctrinaire or black and white about things. You know, this is terrible, this is wonderful. I'm wonderful, of course, and you're terrible. But um, it will be, you know, you'll see that there's an honest mix in there. You do sympathize with the things you uh, dislike, or at least you can understand why people would feel that way. And that, that should go into your poem, that's, I mean, so if, if you really look at how you feel about it right now and keep writing and keep writing until it's, it all comes out, um, then you can sort of artistically arrange those elements. But it will be an original poem and it will be an interesting poem because it's an, an authentic response. Uh, other people are welcome to chip in, of course. I agree with Dan. You have to be true to your experience. You know, otherwise it will not be authentic. Um, and like I said earlier, when I was, you know, pontificating about empathy, um, you know, you can empathize, but at the end of the day, you only know your 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 experience. So I think that um, authenticity is is important. Um, and and also, you know, write not to be trite, but write what you know, you know, and um, and write what you care about. So that's all I can offer. I think Dan said it great. I did, this is just kind of a footnote to what um, Shannon and Dan have said, but um, kind of that that um, that act of situating yourself is is really important. And um, and um, sorry, just. Uh, I lost my turn of thought for for a minute, but oh yeah, well with that, you know, write what you you know, be true to yourself, write what you know, speak your truth. It's it to do with you know, situating your situating yourself, and with that is there's a real humility, like you know, there there is a kind of humbling part of this, you know, in a way, like who who am I to be, you know, entering the world of this person? But I think if if it's done. Um, with the deep, out of the deepest respect, and you know, you, you kind of love these subjects. I think that we, you know, keep us working on them for years. I mean, it, it, as a writing teacher, I, I think there are times when we sort of had to say, you know, really, is is this your story to tell? Really, and there's that aspect of it as well. So it involves a lot of um, constructive thought, and um, you know, and it, it is just a really, really humbling thing just uh, um, i'm also a translator and that's also a question for translators you know can i really represent this person can i feel the way they 
you know, at least as much as I can, the way they felt about things. Sam wanted me to talk a little bit as an editor too, and I will, I will have to confess that there are many editors who will just love it if you paint a black and white picture that they agree with, and <laughs> they will publish it in a minute. <laughs> um, so, but if you're going for any, if the question was phrased, how do you do it sensitively? So that's what we were addressing. <laughs> And I think um, part of the ground that 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 a question like that comes from, uh, you know, a high school student, a college student, uh, someone who is not out working in the world yet, what you know is what you've been told so often. And being able to examine rather than swallow simply whatever someone says, uh, I think is the beginning stage to being sensitive, to recognize that, you know, if I tell a student never use a rhyme in a poem, you know what, there's somebody on the other side who says, you need to use a rhyme in a poem, uh, you know, just to use a, a, a kind of a silly example. Um, and so that, that write what you know also has bundled into it, why do you know what you know? You know, do you really know this, or are you just simply repeating what someone told you? Uh, because I think poems that simply repeat don't have much of a place. Someone's already said it. Brittany, what else do we have? Um, so the second question is aimed for Jeanette, but I think anybody could comment on it. Um, it says, when forming a thought-provoking question or when leaving the reader with something to think about, is there ever a way to steer a reader towards a certain way of thinking or to create a better understanding of your poem? What a great question. Thank you. Um, I, I'm not sure that I would want to steer the reader to a certain way of of thinking. Um, I, I, I like poems that kind of blow things wide open and they're, they, they generate new questions and, um, you know, they, 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 they might have different, different pathways of interpreting them that you, it's like poems that we love and we go back to over and over and every time it's a different poem. Like my favorite poem in the world is, um, One Art by Elizabeth Bishop. I don't know if you guys have read that or not, but Honestly, um, I, I don't, I don't think it's meant to, you know, indoctrinate me to any particular way of thinking um, at all. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's so many things. You know, it's, it's a, it's an elegy. It, I guess it, it's kind of a list. It's kind of a cataloging. Lose something every day, and the keys, the things we lose get bigger and bigger. It starts with a set of keys, and then it's a country, and then it's a continent, and it's you know it's the loved one it's um so it's um not about arriving at an, an end point um for me um in, but but more um it's like invitation wow here's i'm gonna i'm gonna keep thinking about that um why would someone why would someone tell me to lose something i don't I don't think that's a good, thing. you know. So, so they these these great poems just for years and years will will stick in your head and and um, you you kind of talk to them in a way for years and years and years. At least you our little playlist of our favorite poems. So that's uh, sorry, that Brittany, that's really rambly. But um, I, I would how would I I, I wouldn't um, uh, give advice to have a certain sort of thesis for the the poem or their 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 conversations their. They're in acts of um, their their explorations, um, and uh, they're they're. I think they're op it's opening a door. It's like an invitation. Great question. Thank you, whoever it was. <laughs> oh, uh, could I chip in? The my my Iraqi friend Dunya McHale, who wrote her book called "The War Works Hard." Her title poem is an attempt an apparent attempt to get you to sympathize with this poor war who has to kill all these people and shovel up all this these buildings and stuff and it's just never-ending work it's just terrible don't you feel sorry for this poor war and never says one word against it but at the end 
you know how she feels and you know how you need to feel. So, I mean, again, if you write honestly, uh, you don't have to hit the reader over the head with it. They're going to get the picture. The idea of personifying a war is really beautiful and interesting to me, you know, because like you said, she's not saying, you know, war is bad, but goes through all the experiences of war, you know, and that's a, uh, that's really interesting to me. I, I love the idea of, of finding different ways to discuss really complicated topics. Um, and this is sort of adjacent to that, but I started watching MASH again the other day and it like spawned this whole topic of, you know, like talking about Vietnam, but not talking about Vietnam and, you know, and, and how you deal with the trauma of war, how a culture, a society, you know, popular culture deals with the trauma of war. Um, so that's just an aside, but really, really interesting stuff. Excellent responses. Um, Brittany, do we have more? Um, I've got one more, um, and this one was for Shannon and Jeanette. Um, it was just about how their time in Scotland helped to influence their work. <laughs> you, go, you go first, Shannon. Well, I lived in Scotland for about almost two years, and uh, it was an amazing, dark, wet experience. <laughs> uh, I, uh, I, I was living in Glasgow, and, uh, you know, it, Glasgow's a really gritty city. I mean, a music city too. So like, if you're into music, it, it's a great place to be and to experience. It's a great sort of lens to experience the city through and helped um, to, you know, to paint my, you know, color my experience there. Um, but Edinburgh is a completely different experience. It's a completely different Scottish experience. You know, you've got Glasgow, which is like the Detroit of, you know, Scotland. And then you've got this like sexy British, you know, uh, Edinburgh. And I say British because, you know, Scotland is very like, we're Scottish, not British, you know, and uh, they're very, you know, Scottish. But, you know, the Queen, vacations in Edinburgh, you know, so you, and it has this like rich history and all this stuff. So it's this very, um, very, uh, interesting. The question was, how do you, how did it color? Was it, can you repeat the question again? Um, it was how your time in Scotland helped to influence your work. Yes. Okay. So, uh, that said, it you know, like I said, it's a beautiful place. It's a green place, but it's very dark, very dreary, potentially very depressing place to exist. Uh, great for writing because you just get to stay inside all day. I mean, when I was working on my my uh, my dissertation, I literally I say it, I like spent two weeks in bed because I just like all the time didn't leave my room. It was fine. It was raining anyways. There's no reason to go out there. Um, but yeah, it it um, it definitely influenced me um, to I mean explore really dark topics. Honestly, uh, it you know gothic uh, themes uh, and it was, um, I don't know, it's, it's hard. I, I never really considered how, you know, that place, uh, aside from, you know, the things I learned, the topics I explored, you know, really influenced my writing. Um, but yeah, I mean, when you spend, it's kind of like COVID, honestly, I mean, for people who don't have children like myself <laughs> who can write <laughs> and, you know, spend all day inside and not do anything, you know, that's what it was for me. You know, I had a room of my own, so to speak, you know, I had all the time in the world and I had, you know, like the, the, you know, the constant deadline of, of workshop and, um, and, you know, rain and 
just be, lots of beer and whiskey. Uh, so all the things a writer needs to uh, to create some really weird stuff. Um, so that's a, that's my take on it. Jeanette, what do you what do you think? That that really resonates, uh, Shannon, with the. Uh, with with my experience too. Well, I like to um, I, I like to go to different places. It sort of shakes me up. I and um, I'm, I'm lucky. Every few years, I've had to been able to take a, a sabbatical, so I would make a point to go somewhere else. And and uh, often as not um, uh, the the, um, the USA. But uh, I went on a big kick for writing retreats for a while too. So there was uh, I'd heard about one in Scotland. Quite a few Canadians had been to Hawthorne and Castle. So if you get to go, you get to be in this castle for for a, a month, um, and they feed you and everything. You get a little little room. Uh, the castle had been owned by uh, Drew Heinz of the Heinz Ketchup Empire. She bought William Drummond's castle. William Drummond, it was his castle in I think the 18th century, something like that, maybe the 19th century. So, so Drew Heights opened a writing retreat in this castle, and I thought that would be great. So they take five writers at a time and um, uh, went there. I think it was 07, yeah. Mm -hmm. And oh my gosh, what what Shannon said? Uh, uh, it was June. It was just freezing. And what the other um, uh, one of the other writers uh, is from. Um, 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 from New York City, from Harlem, and we were freezing. So it was very austere. The rules were you couldn't speak all day. It was like a really austere. But we were really freezing. So I slipped a note under her door and said, "You want? We got to do something here. We're gonna we're gonna freeze to death." So we walked to the nearest town, which was miles away, and bought these hot water bottles, which we put under our feet when we sat at our writing desk. So there's lots of those kinds of, of memories. But yeah, it's a very, very just ancient, evocative place that I, I, I love very much. And I, I did another sabbatical there a couple of years ago at the University of Edinburgh. And um, it's, um, yeah, it's it, it does something to you. And, and, but every day is a little triumph. I didn't freeze. I didn't die today. I didn't melt in the rain or freeze. In the, I'm being a bit extreme. It is very, very beautiful. But um, it does help if, if you can get to so, some of these, um, you know, um, writing retreats. Uh, it's, it's a luxury and a privilege to be able to. Um, I love I love Scottish poetry. Uh, I met some poets there. So it was just um, mind expanding and that's where I found out about John Clare. I, I didn't study John Clare's poetry when I was um, studying um, English literature. Uh, I'd never heard of him. So you can learn new things if you go to Scotland. <laughs> yeah, just to add to that, you said, you know, it, it is really that cold. I mean, it's, it's not like it's no joke. I mean, you're not a wimp if you complain about it because literally the sun came out like two days a year uh and it like fully out and i mean i never appreciated uh the food i left in the states more than i did uh living there i mean i i used to say like even the salt is bland i mean like there's like a whole it, it's like this whole british scottish experience is very dreary but it also is you know, it's it's an experience and it's immersive and it does something to you. It casts a spell on you and your work. And I think that's so important as, you know, writers to immerse yourself in experiences if you have the, you know, um, the luxury to do so. And granted, I made it happen. You know, I quit my job, uh, you know, broke my lease, broke up with my boyfriend, you know, got a student loan and just did it, you know, made it happen. Uh, and I don't regret it. You know, even when I was paying on it years after the fact, you know, I don't regret it um, because it changed me, uh, not only as a person, but as a writer and um, pushed me to limits that um, I'd not gone previously. And I think that all, I think that's the purpose of, of these immersive experiences and, and the value of them as well. Yeah, gloom, gloom can be very productive. <laughs> I mean, like if someone's writing a novel, you, like, like with everything, everyone, all the characters are happy and life is perfect. You don't have a story. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, just thinking, uh, that advice, Shannon, of getting outside your comfort zone as a writer, 
is one that nobody wants to hear. And yet I think just about any writer says that's when things started happening. So yeah, it's a, a little bit like, you know, that first jump into the pool, you know, you, you're not going to get there sitting at the edge. You got to jump in uh, and do it. Uh, Brittany, have we made it through the questions? Okay, we're all done with questions, so we'll we'll wind it up here. Um, are there any last words uh, that any of our panelists would like to give before we uh, sign off? Um, I just wanted to mention something to Jeanette. Um, there's another obscure poet you might want to look into, Hartley Coleridge. Oh, believe, believe it or not, he was actually the son of Samuel Taylor Coleridge and lived in the Lake District at the same time as Wordsworth. However, if you ask anyone in the Lake District at that time uh, who the poet was, they go, oh, Hartley Coleridge. Yeah, of course. We know him. Right. Yeah. Uh, he was a little baby. And wasn't he the little infant in the poem Frost at Midnight? The little baby. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Amazing. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, thank you, Dan. And uh, no, I just wanted to thank um, all the for students and for the great questions and what a how much fun this was. I, I'm going to check out Hartley. Good tip. I hadn't thought about him for, for a little while. I like that you recognize that he is a little baby in that one poem. You're like, oh, yeah. You're looking at old family photos or something. <laughs> yeah, Cross and Midnight's so great. Yeah, and I remember the little baby asleep in his cradle. No, he <laughs> maybe he's sort of whimpering. Or, but anyway, he's in the poem. <laughs> Good old Harley. <laughs> well, with that in mind, we'll say goodbye from Pierglass Poetry Panels. Thank you for joining us today, and we'll look for you next time.